22nd day of April 2019, allegedly according to that thing we call a calendar, and this indeed is the Ocelli Effect. Broadcast originating from Ocelli.com, but also heard in a variety of other places. We do appreciate you for tuning in no matter where you are and when you are, because you could be catching this further on down the stream via your final slab of choice, your applicable application, your podcatcher du jour, uh, no matter how you're doing it, glad to have you along. So we do begin the broadcast week, generally speaking now, for quite some time, because we've been doing a long series with Jordan Maxwell on religion, uh, and quite frankly, it's, it's you know, we, we've had a few weeks off, Jordan was out of town or whatever, or I was sick, or a couple different things happened, but I mean, more than 20 episodes now, uh, already recorded, and really still a lot more to be done. Now, you can get a lot deeper into these topics all by your lonesome if you want, by going to jordanmaxwellshow.com. You gotta put all three of those words together. Jordan Maxwell Show dot com. Why? Because that is the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's. And over there you will find not only a contact point, so you can reach out to the man himself, the actual guy, not, you know, somebody just using his name for some reason. But Jordan Maxwell himself, it's his website, but there's also the Research Society over there which you can join and I'll give you the links to along with the podcast or if you're seeing or hearing this on YouTube, it's seeing it on YouTube and there's nothing to see except a slide uh, and uh, you get to hear the show. But if you're hearing this on YouTube or you're uh, listening to this on a uh, pod of any type, you'll find that the links are there to go and look at the Research Society, where you can get much more in-depth on this topic, which is religion. And uh, generally, it's it's focused on Western religion and the organized religions, if you will, uh, of, of today, but a lot of history built in there, but also government, the monetary system, secret societies, a whole lot of deep dives there. For a one-time fee, you join the Research Society, and uh, there there is tons and tons of data there, and many terabytes yet to be added. For a one-time uh, subscription fee, you can become part of the Jordan Maxwell Research Society. And you can make a donation to Jordan. You can uh, purchase a couple of videos that stream over there. And like I said, just email Jordan, interact with him, let him know that you appreciate what it is he has been doing for, wow, nearly 60 years. <laughs> okay. You know, we're, we're talking way more than half a century here. Jordan Maxwell has been attempting to educate people about the hidden truths, which are in some cases in plain sight and in other cases quite esoteric. <laughs> meaning uh, that they are a cult and they are hidden and they are symbolic and so on and so forth. But again, that journey can all begin at Jordan Maxwell show dot com. So without any further ado, I know it takes a little while, Jordan, but I want to make all those points real clear. Uh, very good to have you along on this particular moon day or Monday. How you doing, sir? I uh, think okay, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so we'll find out as we go along. Well, as listen, as per always, we start out the broadcast and then we figure out how we're doing because <laughs> you never yeah, can right. tell <laughs> on a daily basis. But uh, really good to have you along. Now, it, it has been Easter week, um, and obviously the last week that we did this, we we discussed a lot of stuff about Easter, what it actually means, what the meaning that is generally spoken to in a societal way is out there. Uh, you know the, the the culture that's been created around the ideas of Easter. But you know what? We missed a couple of things. Um, and, and a few people have questions because there were bombings in Sri Lanka that were apparently aimed at some churches. And I'm going to cover that in the news later on, uh, you know, probably tomorrow for sure on Tuesday, but also uh, various other days. I'm going to have to get deep into it. But uh, so there's a couple of questions about that that are kind of sitting behind. But outside of that, you know what we skipped last week? is uh, mm. the whole rest of the, the oddity of the culture. And the time of year, you started discussing it, and I think I probably derailed the conversation because, you know, it is springtime. It is a time of rebirth, generally speaking, in the Northern Hemisphere anyway. Um, and there's a couple of symbols that are sort of, I don't know, just... The, the, you know, the, the, there's all these explanations <laughs> about yeah. why it is there's colored eggs and a bunny and all these other interesting things that are added into the Easter culture. Um, 
you know, and, and you didn't even talk about the, the meaning of the word Easter itself, by the way, during that discussion, which, uh, which I think we should cover because look, it's only the, what, the day after now. Um, again, uh, you know, the day after the Easter holiday, the Easter week, and they stressed it when they were covering this during the news that this is like the holiest week for all Christendom, uh, so on and so forth. So I think it still needs to be addressed a little more. And these other symbols, um, there's also something else that I'm going to have to pull up that there was a conversation on Twitter that involved you, but I'm going to have to go get that because I just remembered it when uh, somebody started describing things as pagan and I found it kind of funny and I'm going to run it by you. But um, how about we get into this concept of spring and Easter and the eggs and see, I, I, I am what I call a pagan. So I have my own ideas <laughs> about what the colored eggs mean, but uh, I'd yeah. like you to break it down though. And, um, you know, let's begin there if you don't mind. Well, let, let's begin. With what, what do you think the, the colored eggs represent? Well, there's certainly a symbol of fertility. Um, and this is at the same time when various pagan belief systems, at the same time of year, Easter, uh, when, when springtime would come to the northern hemisphere again, uh, where fertility was much in the, uh, in the practices. Yeah, in, the, in the picture, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, uh, all the plants begin to grow, all the animals get, begin to reproduce, and they, and then later on they're having their young and they grow. And as, and as spring grows into summer, the animals have, have all reproduced. Uh, everything that's alive is reproducing. And there's so much color. All the flowers and, and plants and trees and color is everywhere, especially with flowers around the northern hemisphere. you got the beautiful, beautiful flowers. And so the color is very big with spring. There's no color, period. In winter, it's just frozen. But in spring, it's very colorful with all the plants and the animals and the different color, uh, you know, animals that, that we have. And they're all reproducing, coming up with new, new offspring. And so this is why the animals come out in the spring because it's getting warm and life is changing. Life is coming back to the northern hemisphere. Right. And so that's why even we humans, we start thinking the same way. That's why we have spring weddings. Because we're getting ready to reproduce again. We didn't have enough babies and enough people. We're going to reproduce again. So now we're getting spring weddings and the humans are going to get together and it's going to be very colorful. And so that's why you have the egg because the egg represents the reproduction of life. Mm. And actually, if you go back to the old Phoenician Canaanites thousands of years ago, there was a, there was a goddess that was connected with uh, with the, the worship of the lights and spring and the coming back to life. And she held in her arms a rabbit. And the rabbit mm-hmm. always represented fertility. It represented the, the uh, continual reproduction of life because rabbits are always reproducing. And so that's why the rabbit became important even thousands of years ago in the symbolism because the rabbit represented some, uh, an animal that just reproduces <laughs> without stop. And so uh, the rabbit becomes important back in two, you know, three or 4,000 years ago, back in the, in the ancient world of Phoenicia Cana, where we call today Israel, in that area of the world, there was actually a goddess in, in spring, and she was carrying a rabbit. And the, and the rabbit have was carrying an egg, and so this is the idea behind the the Easter egg. And the egg represents fertility, and that's when the animals and plants and everything else begins to reproduce itself mm-hmm. when the sun comes back to the northern hemisphere in spring. And so we and what what causes that to happen is that the sun, which was dead for three days in winter, is gone down south is dead but to us in the northern hemisphere is dead. And so when it comes back, it starts its annual journey on the December twenty fifth, it starts its annual journey back to the northern hemisphere. And three months later, ninety degrees and ninety days later, 
Uh, it has come back to the Northern Hemisphere and officially, 90 days later, it officially crosses over the equator. Coming back to the Northern Hemisphere, it actually crosses our equator. And so that time was very special to the ancient people because it represented life coming back to the northern hemisphere. Everything's going to, all the plants are going to begin to grow, etc. Hmm. And so, um, well, th- this is a practical matter because first of all, there's a lot of agrarian societies at that point which depended on their agriculture. So what did you do? You, you, you stored things for the winter because nothing was going to grow, number one. So, uh, you, you had to know that this was the time when the earth was going to soften up again. It wasn't going to be hard. It was going to be fertile, you know, and useful That's to right. plant a seed again, to plant seeds, to plant a seed, whatever. Uh, but also, you know, the idea that all the colors are on the eggs the reason why the colors are there is because in a literal sense during spring this is when colors would emerge directly because what happens flowers bloom very practical again flowers yeah, bloom what I said. the flowers are all representing beautiful colors right and they it provide all variety. represents yeah. the coming back of life right life was coming back on the in the northern hemisphere all the birds are reproducing the animals are reproducing the, the beautiful flowers all kinds of just hundreds of thousands of beautiful flowers coming back to life in the spring. And so it's a big celebration for life coming back to the earth. But Jesus said he would come back. And Jesus is God's son, the light of the world. So the son is coming back. He is coming back to bring life to the world. And as I said last week, the Egyptians understood that the sun was pure energy pure energy and so energy is life and the sun was life itself it was the progenitor of energy so it was life itself and the ancient people said that if the sun were to be stingy and keep its its energy and not share it with us the sun would ultimately last forever because it's energy and energy is life but the sun for some reason, decided to share his energy with us. And so, therefore, God's son is dying because the son is giving his energy up for us continually. And obviously, he's going to run out of energy one day. It may be billions of years, but he's going to run out of energy one day. And the sun is a star, and the star will die. Hmm. And so, therefore, the ancient people said that God's Son, the light of the world, the one we call Jesus, he was God's Son, he gave his life so that you might live. He died so that you might live. Uh, and the symbolism is the Son is dying each day because it's giving his energy away. And, therefore, he's going to die completely when he runs out of energy. But, thank God, he won't do that for a while. <clears throat> but the son will die one day, so ultimately God's son is dying and giving his life so that you might live. <clears throat> Very simple. Right. Now, now here, here's an interesting thing that I want to interject here because th- th- this is fascinating when we take a look at the story that's told that goes along with what you're explaining. All right. Because, uh, th- th- this was the Holy Week, right? And, uh, so, so a lot of people took notice that these churches were attacked in, in Sri Lanka at this time during Easter services, literally on Easter. Um, but what, what's fascinating about that is that, uh, it, it's because it's at a time period. The reason why these kind of things are done during, you know, say Easter or whatever is because regardless of how, you know, some people think it's like a, um, you know, uh, an attack on Easter itself. It's really an attack to inspire even more attention. You know, uh, a church is being attacked on another day might not be quite as attention getting, number one. So, so I'm going to leave that alone for a minute because the image and the thing that started on Twitter where your name came up in the conversation was, was kind of funny. Uh, another person had tweeted a, a picture. And said, you know, that this is a very interesting Holy Week and all that, but there's some strange customs that go along with it. And what did they do? They, they pulled up a Getty image of, uh, this, this kid. Now, this is a boy who's probably, uh, I'm gonna guess six, seven, eight, ten years old, somewhere in that range. Uh, dressed as a Roman soldier. 
And what he's doing is holding one of those, what they call a flagellant or, you know, one of the whips with the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the thing from the Passion of the Christ play, let's call it, that actually literally has hooks on the end of it and strips the skin. The, the, this mm-hmm. is something that we've seen as a torture device before. If you haven't seen Mel Gibson's movie, you probably heard it described somewhere. But anyway, he's holding that and there's a couple of these victims that have been, uh, you know, whipped that are uh, on either side of him and it's a Getty image which is a representative of this passion play um seems rather intense to me that it, it, we, we we have a story where yes the son is represented by the character of christ and all of that but what what do you think the point of because somebody said to me in this conversation which went a little strange and sideways what would jordan maxwell have to say is the symbolism of the torture of the son in this play, which I found to be an interesting question. Um, well, I can answer it. Yeah, please. Do. I can answer that. The, the reason why there was the, the we're we're given the understand that Jesus was tortured is because he said himself of himself. He said in the scriptures, "I am the truth and the light." And therefore, since he is the truth and the light, what is being said there symbolically as a metaphor is that Jesus, every time you read about Jesus in the New Testament, you're reading about the truth and the light. And therefore, whatever happens to the truth and the light happened to Jesus. Whatever was said about Jesus, that's what is said about the truth and light. Whatever is done to Jesus, that's what the world does to the truth and the light. Mm -hmm. So Jesus simply represents symbolically the truth and the light. And therefore, we know that the world is not interested, generally speaking, in the truth or the light. The, you know, we have the story, the symbolic story, that makes the point very clearly, if you remember, the governor of the city, I uh, can't remember what it was, I think it was, uh, um, oh, what was the governor's name Pontius in the Pilate, Bible? Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate. Was, the, Pilate, was Pontius the prefect Pilate. of Judea at that time <clears throat> under the Roman Empire. Yeah, and Empire. He, but he brings yeah. Jesus out, and he brings out a, a man, Another man that was in prison, and he says to the city, the whole city is is there at this big gathering, and the and the governor of the city says to the people, uh, according to your tradition, you have a, a a tradition in your religion that says once a year, uh, I can I can release a prisoner, one prisoner I can release as the governor, and I can release him. So today we have two people that were in prison. We have a man named Barabbas, and everyone knows Barabbas, who he is. He's very famous for being who he is. He's a criminal and a liar, and that's why he's been in prison all these years. He's a criminal and a liar, and there's no good in him. Mm. I so think he's in Sunday on, school. He's they, on my left side. And yeah. then uh, you see the picture and you hear this, you read it. Well, I think in Sunday then, school they told me he was a murderer too. Is that, yeah, probably so. Yeah. Probably was because the, the lies are killing. You know, they are killers. Well, that's true too, yeah. So similar and so, still, yeah. Uh, and so then he said, and on my right I have a man, uh, I have Jesus who is very famous for healing the sick and raising the dead and trying to make peace with the whole world of mankind and make everyone uh, and help everyone to get a better life. So he represents the truth and the light. Which one do I, uh, I give to you? And the scripture says in the Bible that with one voice, there was no dissension, with one voice, everyone in the city cried out, give us Barabbas. That's very famous in scripture in the Bible. It says, when Jesus was presented and Barabbas were presented, the whole city said, give us Barabbas. Why? It's a symbolic truth about life. When the, when the city or the person or the, or the family or the city or the county or the state 
or the country or the people of the earth are presented with the truth and the light or the lie, the murderous lies and criminality, the people, the humans on the earth will always say, give us Barabbas. We don't want the truth and the light. Like the movie said, you know, what do you want from me? And the boy said, I want the truth. And the guy said, you can't handle the truth. Mm -hmm. So that was the story in the Bible when Pontius Pilate is presenting uh, the murderous uh, criminal and Jesus representing the truth and the light. The people said, you uh, rabbis, why? Because you can't handle the truth. You're not, you don't want the truth. The truth and the light is not, is to be put to persecuted or nailed to a stake and let it die. Nobody is interested in the truth and the light. We want to hear what we want to hear. <laughs> we want to hear what we will support. We will, we will pay big money to a churches. We will put a lot of money into churches and preachers so they can drive around and fly around in their, in their, you know, in their beautiful uh, jet planes and the Lincolns and the Continentals and they can live very high. Why? Because we'll pay them because they tell us what we want to hear. Mm -hmm. We want to hear that the Lord loves us and that no matter what we do, we're still loved and when we die, we're going to go to heaven with the Lord and we're going to see our family and all of that. That's what we want to hear. We don't want to hear the truth and the light. We don't care about the truth and the light. Get rid of it. Well, hang it up, hang, nail it to a stake. Well, here, here's the thing about that, though, Jordan. It, it, it's very much like the election process in, in, in America, too. And I'll tell you why. Because you, you, give us this thing that uh, that we want to hear. Sure, that's one part of it. But it's also uh, uh, don't don't give us the, the thing we're not used to. <laughs> uh, and, and also give us the easy way because look, I can send this guy money and I've got my spot reserved for me in heaven, right? Uh, yep, you know, right. so real easy. I don't have to behave correctly. I don't have to be an honest person. I don't have to stop being a hypocrite. I can just send money to this guy and I've got a spot. It's all good. Uh, that's, I mean, that's <laughs> true. That's exactly right. So, so here's the thing about that though is instead of taking like when I see a politician come out and actually speak the truth, my first thought is this guy's got no no chance of getting anywhere because that's <laughs> <laughs> the end of it. As soon as he does it, he's gone. You know, yeah. that, that, that's that's pretty much the way it works is the second one of these guys really starts to tell you the truth. You know, either they they have an accident uh, or, or or suddenly, well, that you know, would be my thought. When I hear someone <laughs> actually saying what is true, I'm thinking, how long is this guy going to be alive to see the sun come up? Yeah. Yeah. So but what it is, <laughs> though, assassinated soon. is it, it's easier for people to accept the lie if it's a mm. shortcut. Number one. Number two, they're they're used to it it's like you know no give me the guy that lies to me because i know how that works uh <laughs> yeah he's right? like us he's, he's he's one of he's one of the the hood he's uh, one of the the brothers in the hood pretty he's much like us i mean he's a lying thief and and uh and he knows what he's doing he's a criminal and so are we we we're lying and cheating and we're criminals too and so he's one of us he's one of our boys he's one of the home boys we get somebody out there who actually wants to do something to help the the people of the world, and well, they'll kill him, right. they'll assassinate him in front of you, and there's nobody, and nobody will go to jail. Nobody goes to prison when you kill a good man. Well, see, and so back, you, back to Pilate. See, back to Pilate and Barabbas, though it's perfect because it's like we know that this guy is a criminal. <laughs> Yeah, okay. exactly. We, we know that that's exactly. But but let us let us have him. And the funny thing about that story, because let's continue on with it, is that oh, Pilate says, okay, I'm going to take him and punish him. Now, according to the story, this is where the flagellants come in, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, according to what we've always been taught, although I, I'm not sure what the proof of this is. Uh, they, they, you know, they scourged him. They, they whipped and, you know, took the skin from his back pretty much like Mel Gibson showed you in that movie. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, kind of like that. And, uh, he's still alive. He brings him out again and says, look, I've done this. This is what I've decided to do with him. And, uh, the crowd is not satisfied that the truth has been tortured this much, right? Symbolically, he's the truth. So mm -hmm. they're not satisfied that you've wounded the truth. They want it gone. Uh, and, and, and Pilate washes his hands of the situation. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, basically says, look, I'm not responsible for this. Literally, there there is a, a part of the story where he washes his hands as well, right? Yeah, well, that's exactly what happened to the guy with uh, WikiLeaks. I mean, they didn't, they didn't, they're not just on, oh, they want him dead. They want to, the, the powers that be want him brought back here. We're going to kill him. We're going to wish, he's going to wish to hell he had never been born telling the people the truth and the, and the, and the, and, the, and, and explaining to people and trying to help the nation and trying to stand up for the truth and light. Yeah. Well, we're going to kill the truth and the light. He's going to wish he'd never been born. Mm-hmm. So I'll arrest him, beat him up, beat his face in. And bloody him up and bring him back to America. We're going to torture him and nail him to a stake. And that's, that's how much we Americans love the truth and the light. Mm. And so that's exactly what's going on today. Anybody who stands up for the truth is going to end up nailed to a cross symbolically. You're going to be nailed. You're going to, like Jesus said, the, the slave is no greater than the master. Yeah. What they've done to me, they will do to you. They didn't listen to me, and what makes you think they're going to listen to you? So if you try and go out and tell the people what's really going on, like a young man did that was working with the NSA, and he's going to come out and tell us what the NSA and the government's really doing with your information, we will throw him into prison and make him wish to hell he'd have never been born. We'll find every kind of criminal act against him and make him wish he had left the world. Because we'll teach them a lesson. Don't you ever act like you're going to share the truth and the light with the people. The people don't want no truth and the light. Mm. They want to know that their government, no matter if it's a Nazi, fascist, communist government, Moscow or Berlin, and it's murdering people all over the world, we want to know our government is protected. We don't want to hear no truth and light. Period. At the end of the day, that's the bottom line. We're not interested in your truth and light. And so, therefore, it is said you can't handle the truth. Mm -hmm. That's what the military guy said in the court. You can't handle the truth. And so that's what's going on in the Bible. It's a symbolic story where Jesus represents symbolically the spirit of truth and the light. And uh, so... I have said that there's so much more symbolism all around the holidays. And why do we have holidays? That's another point I want to bring out. Why do we have Christmas and Easter and the different holidays and Labor Day and all that? Well, Labor Day comes from the communists, and so because they control the labor, the labor unions, and that's why you have a painter's union and the Plasterers Union, and the Carpenters Union, and the Soviet Union, because it's all based on the collective uh, collecting bargaining and collective unionism, which is, comes, goes back to the Soviet Union. But uh, it's interesting why we have holidays, because, as I said before, if you draw a circle, a perfect circle, and then you put 360 dots around the circle and spread them out around the circle, 360 dots represents 360 degrees of the circle. And we always we always divide the circle into 360 degrees. Why? Because the ancient Babylonians did that. They're the ones that told us to draw a circle and put 360 dots around it. That's a Babylonian, an ancient Sumerian Babylonian idea. And we are still following it today. And then they divided that into uh, four parts. You draw a line from one uh, from one dot directly across the circle, exactly directly across the circle, and you hit the 180th degree, uh, 180. And then you draw another, uh, you go another 90 degrees, and now you can draw another cross across the circle, and that cross is uh, crosses the other one. So now you have a perfect cross within a circle, and you divided the circle into four parts. You now have spring, summer, autumn, winter. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, are telling you the story of God's Son, the light of the world. And so ultimately, the Bible is telling you in a symbolic way, symbolically, not in history, but symbolically, the Bible is telling you about the oldest story the world has ever heard. 
The oldest story that the world has ever known is called The Greatest Story Ever Told. The greatest story ever told is the war between the sun and the darkness of night, the war between light and darkness. Ultimately, on the on this earth, the ultimate war in this world is, is for the minds of men, the war between intellectual, spiritual enlightenment and truth, as opposed to the lies and murderous lies and criminality. So there's a war in heaven between the gods, the gods of the darkness and the gods of light. And the light is always at war with the, with the, uh, with the darkness. And this is why God's son, when he is born each morning, he chases away the demons and the old devil, who is the prince of darkness. And so the prince of darkness in Egypt was named Set. And so when Horus, the, the god of the sun, comes, chases Horus away. And Horus is the god of, and Horus is the god of darkness. I mean, Horus is the god of light, and he chases away his evil brother, which was Set. Why? Because the Set was the god of darkness. We, they realized it got dark at sunset. And so Set was the god of darkness. But when Horus uh, controls the whole world, when the sun is high overhead, we say it's high noon. What time would that be? It's at 12, 12 high noon. And so there's a story in the Bible, according to the symbolism, Jesus is supposedly at 12 years old. He's 12 years old in the temple teaching the wise men. And we're told that we always shown pictures of Jesus as a, as a 12-year-old boy, and he's teaching all the wise men. No, no, that's that's history, and there is no history in the Bible. It's a symbolic story that the truth and the light at 12 noon is as bright as it's going to get. So if you can't get it in your head, the truth and the light about anything at 12 noon, you're not going to get it at all because there is no brighter light on the earth than at 12 noon. So that 12 noon, God's son, the light of the world, is teaching all the important people of the world whatever it is they're supposed to learn. They're teaching you something at 12 noon. And if you can't learn at 12 noon, then you're not going to learn at all. You're not getting it at all. Hmm. So symbolically, that Jesus was not 12 years old teaching the wise men. Jesus is the God's son. He's the son at 12 noon when he is so bright, everybody who's anybody is listening to and trying to learn whatever they're trying to learn at 12 noon because there's no more light on the earth than at 12 noon. So Jesus was not 12 years old. It's talking about 12 noon when the sun becomes known as the most high God because it don't get any higher than high noon. It's a symbolic story. There was no real history of a man at all. And this is why the, the 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 celebration of Easter is very interesting because in the really ancient ancient world we could go back to the very ancient world as far back as we can go and spring was not always called Easter or spring we didn't know it as spring or Easter it was recorded that in the ancient world they recognized this particular time of year. And they called it the marriage feast of the Lamb, the marriage feast of God. Mm -hmm. And they said that God's son was with his mother, and they went to a marriage feast. And in the story in the Bible, Jesus goes to this marriage feast with his mother, Mari, Mary, no, Mari, M-A-R-I, not M-A-R-Y. Mari is a Virgo, Virgo the Virgin, the constellation of Virgo. And so Jesus goes to this marriage feast, and we are told that his mother, uh, when they ran out of wine, there were so many people there, the wine was gone very quickly. So the mother, Mari, goes and tells her son, Jesus, to, that the, that the party has run out of wine. And she wants him to make wine for the people. So it says Jesus went out, and he, uh, and, and he took the water, he got water, and turned it into wine. That's a story in the Bible. It's not history, it's a symbolic story, because that's what happens. Mother 
Mother Mari is actually Mother Earth, Mother Nature. Mother Nature asked God's Son, the Son, the Earth asked God's Son to draw water, which it does. It evaporates the oceans. It draws water. And the water becomes heavy and comes over in, uh, over the land, and it rains. That water that, that Jesus, or God's Son, has uh, drawn is now pouring over. It's over the fields, and it's raining on the grapes, and the grapes we smash and make it into wine. So God's Son has changed water into wine. It's a symbolic story. The entire New Testament is a metaphor. A symbolic metaphor. And, uh, but men have made the story into something which is supposed to be, uh, legitimately history. When in point of fact, there was no man who rose from the dead. There was no man who died and came back. No one is coming back to save us. Nobody. No one is coming back to save the human race. And when you die, you will not be going into heaven with God's son to see your family. You're going into what is called in the Hebrew, Sheol. S-H-E-O-U-L. Sheol was a word for hell. So you're going into the common kind when you leave this world. You're not going into the heavens with God's Mm. son. You're going into a hell or you're going into a grave. And for you then, you will finally experience what we call the end of the world. That's right. You will finally experience what is called the end of the world because it's the end of the world for you. Mm. Everybody else will be doing fine, but you're gone. So it's the end of the world for you. And that's why it's a very interesting story when you start looking at Christianity as a metaphor, a symbolic story of the war between light and darkness, between the good and evil. We give us Barabbas, give us the the criminal. We don't want the truth and the light. We can't handle the truth. We want uh, we want to hear what we're paying people to tell us. We want to hear what we want to hear. And so, therefore, the, all the preachers around uh, in North America and all the preachers in Christendom, they will tell the people what they want to hear, but they won't tell them too much, like an education. They're not going to tell them nothing that has anything to do with education or how to read and how to think. No, they're not going to do that. They're going to tell you what you want to hear about how wonderful heaven will be and how your family is there waiting for you in heaven with the Lord and all of that. It's a wonderful story, but it has no basis in fact whatsoever. And uh, this is why I think the the, the what uh, Rodney Dangerfield said was so was so clever and it was really funny. But I think it was Rodney Dangerfield who said that faith. People who have faith, faith is that wonderful quality that allows you to believe something you know is bullshit. And so that's exactly what I'm saying, that when you believe something, we call you a believer. I don't want Mm. to believe anything. I want to intellectually sit down at the library and read books on ancient theologies and religion and conceptual ideas and where they've come from and spend 60 years looking at the subject of religion. Mm-hmm. And finally, I got what I wanted. I wanted to know and now I know. But now I'm aware, I am now being made aware that you might as well talk to yourself. If you know what's going on, you might as well talk to yourself. Why? Because if you talk to other people, you're going to end up talking to yourself. Nobody's going to want to <laughs> hear what you're saying. Yeah. Nobody's going to care what, what you're saying. They don't, nobody wants to hear the real truth. See, that's, that's <clears> the interesting I, thing I've said a lot of times is that, you know what, if you really start to talk to people about a lot of the things you discover, uh, uh, you, you will, you will wind up kind of lonely. Cause there, there just there are not many people who want to hear the unvarnished truth. Now, a couple of things really quickly here, here, uh, I just put out on Twitter and I also have the live chat room at ocelli.com. If you want to email a question to either Jordan or myself, you can do that too. But if you want to ask a question right now, uh, in the conversation, go right ahead, either at the live chat room at ocelli.com or I am at ocelli effect on Twitter and you can tweet a question to me and uh, I will absolutely enter it into the conversation. Now, we do have a regular listener 
who is listening live that asked a question already. Um, and it's funny because I'm pretty sure this person has listened to every single one of these shows that we've done live. And I, I think that this has come up before and I, maybe they missed it. So let's go back over it because you were talking about the origins of things and, um, you know, and, and how it takes a lot of study to get it and how there are, you know, modern incarnations of different uh, hmm, belief systems that have been sort of introduced and, well, superimposed over the original. Uh, we, we, we've talked about that many times. They actually ask about a, a subject here, which, again, I think we covered this when we talked about the Jehovah's Witnesses, but maybe not. Um, the rapture, Jordan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is the concept of the rapture, which they kind of explain here, you know, about this idea of ascending, and we we know what we're talking about here. Uh, they want to know where that idea comes from, because they do not recall reading about it in the Bible. That that's right. that's the whole question. They don't recall reading <clears throat> about it in the book, Bible. Yeah, there was a book, a very scholarly, well put together a scholarly book. Uh, came out many years ago and I, and I got a hold of it as soon as it came out because I know about these uh, subjects and so when I saw it, I thought that there's an interesting book. It was called The Rapture Cult and it explained the story of where the rapture idea came from. And so <clears throat> the idea basically was what the Apostle Paul was talking about. Once you see the light on something, you are changed forever. Instantly, you are changed once you see something. And you may be going through life in the dark, but once you actually, for the first time, realize the actual truth of what you're seeing, then it will change your life and you'll be totally different. You'll be totally different once you see it. And so, in the book, The Rapture Cult, the author talked about where the rapture idea came from. And he brought it back to in England. Uh, many, many years ago, there was a very extraordinarily wealthy lady who <clears throat> was very, very religious and she was giving large sums of money to the church. And when, she, and, she, but she ended up being, uh, an alcoholic who was experiencing the DTs. <clears throat> she was beginning to see things because she was an alcoholic, a confirmed alcoholic. And she had all kinds of strange experiences because she was going through withdrawals or whatever. And, but she was still very wealthy and her money was still spendable. And so the church, always uh, respected her because she is the money of the church. She's financing the whole operation. Mm -hmm. And so they never said anything. They didn't try and do much to help her with her alcoholism, but they didn't mind taking the money that she was giving up. Oh, well, they, and, they never and, criticize and, the people that are actually paying their bills. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah, she's the one that was paying all the bills, so the church went along with it. And let her, let her be a drunk. It, uh, not going to change her, but if you if you try and stop her and try and clean her up, she's going to be very angry, and uh, and the money's going to be shut off, and that's it. So just mind your own business. Let her be what she wants to be. As long as the checks are coming, don't bar don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. And so she had a vision from the Lord. She said when she was three sheets to the wind, she was an alcoholic, and when she was totally three sheets to the wind, she had a vision from the Lord, and the Lord told her that when you pass away, you're going to be raptured into heaven. And that was the word that she said the Lord told her. Mm -hmm. That she would be raptured and she's going to go to heaven from the earth. There will come a day when it's time for her to go and she will go directly into heaven. That's what the Lord told her after the bottle of, of whiskey. And, uh, and so she kept ranting and raving about that to the clergyman in the church that you need to teach this to the people. There's going to be a rapture. And I know because the Lord told me last night, after I finished those two bottles off, the Lord talked to me and he told me it was going to be a rapture. Mm. And so it was actually an old lady, a wealthy old lady in England, uh, as from what I can remember from the book came out, out in the 60s. <clears throat> but it was an old lady in England who, uh, and the book is called The Rapture Cult. See if you can find it on the web. You might be able to order it from, from uh, the bookstore. 
the rapture cult. And she talked about how she told the clergy, look, I'm financing this church, or you teach the people what I'm telling you. You tell them there's going to be a rapture, and they're going to be raptured into heaven. And uh, and so the church clergymen, they started letting her talk, and they started promoting it. And it got to be so uh, so interesting and so delightful, other churches began teaching it. Before you know it, it was going all around town. This old lady's money had really struck a a, a nerve, and she was teaching the rapture the rapture and everybody else started teaching the rapture and so the churches they don't care one way or the other if it's true or not they just go along with the get along because after all it's just a it's just a business the church is in entertainment and that's what the people want to hear so we will tell them we will tell them and it will in, inculcate that into our teachings so before you know it the whole idea of the rapture became the, the thing to do the, the subject to talk about and so Christians were talking about the rapture, when in point of fact, it was a drunk old lady with her money that caused the rapture to be taught. And it's in a book, and it's, got, and it's not the only book, incidentally. There have been other books written on the subject. Right. But that was the first one I came across called The Rapture Cult. And, uh, I think there's and some, read it. Get it and read it yourself. I think there's some interesting uh, material on this as well at uh, Christianism dot com, which is a website that uh, you yeah. highly recommend as well, uh, and and you, you'll find information about this. Uh, the, the the rapture. It's an interesting story, um, and here's here's the odd part about this. Even in these, uh, you know, the delusions of a drunken woman, or some of the uh, fables that are made up, it, you know, it, there, there there's a lesson. <laughs> there's a lesson and there's an interesting element that's usually built into them, like the concept of the rapture in the first place, right, Jordan? Um, mm-hmm. The idea of ascent into heaven. Well, a couple of reasons why there's an ascent into the heavens or into heaven itself. Well, that's where God is. I mean, according to everybody, ask a child, like you say, where's God? They'll point upward to the sky. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, but there's that, but there's also... The idea of ascent that existed before Christianity, the concept of ascending, the concept of rising, the concept of being uplifted, lifting up. And indeed, when you do gain knowledge or when you do gain happiness, when you do, you can feel literally uplifted. I mean, yeah, it's built into our language, too. But uh, but what I'm saying is that it goes beyond that. There is a feeling of uh, being larger, being, you know, radiating almost, right? I mean, the concept of being thrilled. All of these things lend themselves to this concept of the ascent. So it's no wonder that, I mean, it might have been an alcohol poisoned, uh, fueled <laughs> bit of imagination from this lady that started the concept. But the, the idea here is that a lot of people believe that, you know, this is something they're waiting to just randomly happen at some point. You know, it's going to occur when the signs are right. When the end of the world comes, the good people are going to be raptured and everybody else is going to be here to face the, the horrors, the terrors, right? Uh, yeah. you know, and, 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 but there's and always people some love truth. that. People yeah. love that. That's wonderful. That's wonderful to know that I'm going to be getting out of here and you guys stay here and suffer through it and I'm going to go into heaven with the Lord. Mm. I'm going to go with Lord Jesus and I'm going to be in heaven. And, and it's going to be very, un, uh, it's going to be very disappointing when you find out there is no Lord in heaven. There is no Jesus. There is no Lord in heaven. It's a symbolic story of the war between light and darkness. And you're in the dark and you're still in the dark. And I'm trying to enlighten you, but you don't want to hear somebody who's, who's trying to enlighten you. So you're saying, give us Barabbas in your head. Give us the, the lie. We want to hear the wonderful story. We don't want to hear the truth and the light. <clears throat> so, well, but anyway, it also gets you know, into this idea, though, that there's advantages, right? Because th- th- that's an interesting thing that that kind of just went through this whole discussion so far. This idea that you gain an advantage, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if you're uh, if you're a Jew, you're you're one of the chosen people. You're you're separate. You're special. Right. If you give money to that preacher on TV, hey, he's got a spot for you in heaven. You know, I mean, Visa or MasterCard, you can buy it. Uh, but, but you have a special place. If you, uh, you know, follow these certain things, well, then you might get to actually rise up into the air and disappear with the rest of us. You know, you, you get to come along and be part of the club. Mm-hmm. That's right. And that's what we love. Humans love that to be part of the group. We mm-hmm. want to be loved by our fellow man. We want to be appreciated and respected by our fellow man. And I said that on one of our very first, very first shows I did. I brought that out. How right. children in school do not like to be laughed at and mocked because they don't know their lesson. They didn't study. They didn't do their homework. And now that the teacher is calling upon them and they have to go up to the blackboard and do a problem for this, for the class that they're supposed to have studied the night before, but they didn't do their homework, and now all the kids in the class are going to laugh at this at this poor child because he didn't do his homework and he doesn't know how to do what he's supposed to be doing. So then they're laughing at him, and no child wants to be laughed at and mocked by the class. Well, the same thing is true with adults. No adults like to be laughed at and ridiculed for being stupid because they said something dim with it and stupid, and people are laughing at him, and now they mock him and laugh at him. Nobody likes to be mocked and laughed at because they said something foolish or stupid. And so that's why we don't say anything. We just keep our mouth shut, and we go along to get along with the group. Wherever all of our friends are going, that's where we'll go. And whatever our friends are listening to, that's what we want to hear. Whatever our friends are, are eating, that's what we'll have. And so we want to be part of the group. We don't want to be laughed at and mocked by our fellow man and and put into a, into a position where people are laughing at you. And that's typical of humans. We don't like being mocked and laughed at. We want to be appreciated by our fellow man. So we want to go to the ball game with everybody. When they're all drinking beer and going to the going to the ball game, we'll go too. So we can be a part of them and they'll love us. And that's why the scripture says, if you continue to run with your friends after you learn the real truth, uh, then, then you're going to find out they don't want you. They're not, they don't like you. They don't want you around them. Why? Cause you know things they don't know and you don't go with them to the ball games. You don't go with them to the beer drinking. You don't party with them. You don't have anything to do with them, and they know it, and they know that they are stupid, and they know that you're smart, and they don't want anything to do with you. And so this is why Jesus said, what they have done to me, they will do to you. If you start studying and educating yourself, and you find out the real truth, and the, and you are in the light, and you now got the light and the truth, you're going to find out that the slave is no greater than the master. What they have done to me, the son, they will do to you. Because the sun brings light into the world, and we kill God's son. We nail him to a stake because we don't want to hear the truth and the light. Mm. So that's it. No, absolutely true. You know, one one other thing about this uh, th- this photo I started the conversation with about the flagellants and the whips and all this is um, that you know somebody said, "Well, gee, this looks like a lot of fun and everything on this uh, holy and fun holiday where you know torture is being featured." Um, somebody said, well, you know, the, what actually happened there is that the, the Romans introduced the concept of paganism into the story. And I, I almost fell over when I read that. Um, <laughs> because paganism in, in this person's mind, because blood is being let in the act here, yep. uh, it mm-hmm. becomes pagan. But, um, I got some bad news for you if you haven't read your Bible lately. Um, there's a lot of bloodletting in the Bible of all sorts. Uh, you know, J- Jesus is not the only character to have been whipped. Uh, there, there, there is no, the sacrifice. The, of the Old Testament yeah. is filled with, with mass killings, yes. massive killings and murdering of women and children and babies and, and the firstborn and killing and murdering. Uh, it's the Old Testament Bible is filled with that kind of stuff. And oh, so, yeah. I mean, you know, one of the most brutal episodes to me was that whole uh, uh, incident at Shechem when uh, 
when, you know, okay, well, I'm going to take your daughter as my wife now to try and honor the fact that I have, uh, uh, you know, uh, soiled her honor kind of yep. thing. And then the brothers go in and murder everybody in the city, you know, and uh, it's... <laughs> It, it, you know, while they're sitting there all sick from being circumcised, the men are kind of crippled because if you get, you know, circumcised as an adult, you're not in good shape afterwards. Oh, um, God, no. You know, so so here it is. Uh, pretty brutal indeed. Uh, the, the slaughtering of humans, the, the requested slaughter, even by, well, you know, at one point there's a story of Isaac too, right, where, well, you know, hey, look, sacrifice your son on my altar, um, mm -hmm. interesting, you know, so, so His first altar boy. Yeah. The first <laughs> altar. So, you know, to call this pagan is kind of funny because really what was pagan was uh, more of an adherence. I know this is a very tough topic for some people, but it was more of an adherence to what Jordan was initially talking about, which was this recognition of nature and the order That's of nature. That's precisely what the word pagan means in the Latin. Right. Go back to the Roman Empire. And I said to you before in explaining this, that when Caesar, when the Caesar of Rome decided he was going to be a Christian, everybody who was anybody like today in Washington, D.C., if the president becomes a member of something and he's decided to, to, of himself he's going to be a member of something, Anybody who wants to be on his good side will join it with him mm -hmm. because the boss is joining the Christian, so we'll be a Christian. We'll join too. And if he's going to be in the Boy Scouts, well, we'll join the Boy Scouts too because he, uh, this is what he wants. We'll be like him. We'll be his buddies and his friends, so we'll join too. And this way it keeps us in good with the boss because he'll like us because we are you know, we're, we're adopting the same thing he wants. So we will do the same thing he's doing. So stay in good with Caesar. And so that's what happened. And so the people of the, of the Roman Empire, the regular normal people of the Roman Empire out in the field, uh, the, the Romans who said that they were in the in crowd, they joined Christianity and now they're in with the Caesar of Rome. And they're worshiping in his religion and worshiping his God. And he's a Christian and so are they. Now they are in the in crowd with Caesar. And they're very pompous and arrogant about how important they are because they're like Caesar now. They've accepted the same religion as Caesar. They've accepted all the stories like Caesar did. And so now we're, we're his buddies and we're his friends. And so we are the in crowd but the poor working class people out there around the empire and all the different countries around the, around Rome and in Europe who were just plain old working class people who had all of these ancient stories uh, handed down to them for thousands of years, they were referred to in Latin as pagans. Pagans simply meant people of the mountainside. People of the hills out there around the countries of the world that Rome ruled, they were not like us. We are in, we're in the church. We have a connection with Caesar. We are important. We're the senators and the congressmen. We are important people. Why? Cause we're in, we're in tight with the, with the boss. He is a Christian and we are too. And therefore we don't want anything to do with those poor unwashed Poor people out there in the hinterlands who believe and who are you know, just herding their sheep and providing us with food and providing us with, with uh, all of our needs. Uh, poor people who are working, they are not like us. So they are referred to in Latin as pagan. Pagan means people of the hillside, people mm -hmm. of the hills. So therefore today we say the same thing. We are Christian. That means we are in tight with the Lord. The Lord loves us. He don't care about the ancient Chinese who are out in the middle of China and never heard about the Lord because they're a bunch of pagans. Well, that's exactly what the Romans said about the people of their day. If you're not in Rome and you're not hobnodding and then sipping the wine with the, with Caesar, then that means you're a pagan. You are a person of the mountains. You're just a regular farmer. You're people of the hillside. And so that's what the word pagan meant. It doesn't mean you're evil or bad. It just means you're not like 
the, the, the in crowd. You're not like the Christians in the in crowd. And so that's where it all comes from. We're still the same arrogant pompous and arrogant people we've always been on the earth. We're still calling other people who are not like us pagans. Mm -hmm. And so that's the name of that tomb. But I was going to go on. I wanted to go on with this idea about Easter. Yeah, no, and I in, definitely and, want and to in get the into ancient that. world. I was well, going to say in the go well, on. Hang, hang on, on just a this. second, because you know we're, we should really take the break now and uh, and and get into Easter as as a fresh topic because the meaning of, of the word is interesting too. I think, um, <clears throat> but you know the the concept of the hierarchy in Rome is is really an intense thing that I think also needs to be gone back over a little bit. Because uh -huh. uh, at, at the time Julius Caesar first, you know, became the emperor, uh, the fact is that he had to reorganize everything because it was such a mess, and uh, uh, he ascended to a status there. But there was always a hierarchy. There mm -hmm. was always this, you know, if you lived in Rome, then you were a Roman. You know, everything else was kind of everything else, regardless of the size of the empire. It wasn't uh, culturally inclusive at that time. There was a very extreme hierarchy, and even the people of Rome, who are the common people in Rome, uh, they were fully dependent on the state, fully dependent on the highest figure, and the decrees which came, you know, from the godlike figure, because Augustus would do that later, ascend himself to to the god status uh, after the senators decided to turn against Julius Caesar. <laughs> much mm -hmm. uh, much later, Augustus Caesar uh, would would definitely set things up. And of course, July and August are two months right there in the center of the calendar. Uh, the Julius seventh, and Augustus Caesar. Exactly. Augustus Caesar and Julius Caesar. Exactly. But I think we should get a lot deeper into the Easter topic. But we're going to take this break really quick and give you the full hour to uh, <laughs> to go into this Easter topic. And also, you guys still can ask questions either on Twitter or in the chat room at Ocelli.com. Either way, uh, while we're live on the air, if you email them to us afterwards or, you know, my email's at info at Ocelli.com. But you have to actually go to Jordan Maxwell's show dot com and email Jordan. You can always ask questions in between these shows, but we love to see what it is you're thinking while you're listening so uh either way though we accept the questions and, and i will read them in if you send them to me so either way uh let's continue on with this discussion of easter the day after easter <laughs> here on the ocelli effect with jordan maxwell we're continuing actually the series on religion special dogmatic theology which is what i've been calling it for quite a while and uh I know I've learned a lot, and hopefully you have and will do the same. Stick around we'll right. now here at Ocelli.com. Now, i got to say something. It is Monday, and I'm not going to get into a whole bunch of stuff, but later on in the week we're going to talk about a way that uh, maybe you can get involved directly in spreading the word about the show. I've mailed out a couple of little goodie packages to people under certain conditions, and uh, uh, if I have money for postage this week, I'll continue to do so, but we'll talk about that on a show later in the week. For now, I have Jordan Maxwell with me, and I want to get right back to it after I remind you that uh, there's only one website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's website on the Internet, and it is Jordan Maxwell Show. Dot com. Yes, you have to put all three of those words together into one word, Jordan Maxwell Show, and then dot .com. And if you go there, there is the uh, Research Society, which you can join for a one-time fee. Now, that money goes to help the webmaster who is putting up a whole lot of data, uh, a, a ton of research, articles, images, uh, video, audio, all kinds of stuff that is up there in the Jordan Maxwell Research Society section of the website, but you gotta actually join to get in there. I am a member. Uh, however, there's other stuff at jordanmaxwellshow.com, including a, uh, you know, a, a donate button, an email button where you can just contact Jordan directly if you like. Uh, it could be that, uh, that, that, you, there's some question you want to ask that you don't want answered on the air. I don't know. Jordan likes to hear from people, by the way, who uh, who appreciate him. I know that. <laughs> he didn't ask me to say that, but I know that uh, that he would definitely be thrilled to hear from you if you wanted to write him a note and just tell him that you appreciate all the work he has done to try and educate people over the past more than a half century. Okay, uh, doing presentations like this, not just on religion, but on a whole lot of other topics. Hey, and you know what else is over there? A couple of videos you can purchase for just a couple of bucks. 
And uh, any of that stuff, the, the videos or if you make a donation, that goes directly toward Jordan's well-being and uh, in, in support of, uh, of him directly because this is the only website that is his. You join the Research Society, it helps out the webmaster. You, you do something for Jordan, it actually helps out Jordan. <laughs> but that's the only place where you can do it, jordanmaxwellshow.com. Okay, so now that I've gotten that out of the way, Jordan, once again, I cut you off, and I'm sorry, but I, I wanted to make sure that we didn't break this into pieces. Um, Easter, in and of itself, right? Kind of an odd-sounding word, really, because Easter, well, okay, I could look at it and say there's northeast, west, south. What is Is it that? You know, is it the Well, uh, I would say that uh, even before we had the Easter celebration in the in the world that we have today, which is given to us mostly by the proto-Germans and the Germanic peoples of the world of Europe, they gave us the idea of spring, and the, it's a, basically a Germanic idea, German idea. But uh, in the prehistoric, in the most ancient world, they they also recognized that the sun's coming back, bringing life back to the northern hemisphere. So they had a celebration of spring, and it was in the Bible, it's in the scriptures. It's called the Marriage Feast of Cana. And we all heard, uh, Christians have heard the story about Jesus going to the Marriage Feast of Cana. And the idea of the Marriage Feast, who was getting married at the Marriage Feast? Who was getting married? Well, God the Father was marrying Mother Nature. That's what is referred to as the marriage feast of Cana because it was an old Canaanite story, an old ancient Canaanite story called the marriage feast. And the marriage feast was the official marriage between God the Father and Mother Earth, Mother Nature. And God the Father, when he marries Mother Nature, is going to obviously impregnate her so that new life can come into the world. So God the Father is going to marry Mother Earth or Mother Nature, and there's going to be a marriage feast because you can't have God the Father running around impregnating uh, his wife unless there's a marriage feast, unless there is an actual marriage. You can't have him just, you know, uh, reproducing without a marriage. And so this is why there's an official marriage feast called the Marriage Feast of Cana. It's an old, ancient Canaanite story. And the story is basically that in the spring, the summer, and the spring will bring back life into the earth. God the Father is going to marry Mother Earth, Mother Nature. And, and how, and, and, and of course, after the marriage feast, there's going to be uh, a, a reproduction of life. And so Mother Earth is going to be pregnant. And she's going to give birth to new life now. Why? Because God the Father and her got together, and now she's going to have offspring. <clears throat> and so what, what are you talking about? Well, it's very simple. It's a symbolic story that God the Father is going to impregnate Mother Earth after the marriage feast is, is concluded. And so what are you talking about? Well, in, in ancient India, there was a god, there was a word for god in the ancient India called, this god was called Rain, R-A-I-N. Rain was the name of a, of a god in, in ancient India. And so today, when God the Father reigns on Mother Earth, it's, the rain was perceived to be the, uh, a life-giving liquid coming from the Father the life-giving flow of liquid coming to the Mother Earth during the marriage feast or after the marriage feast is over, God the Father is impregnating Mother with the sacred fluid, the fluid of life. And the fluid of life was the water. And so, therefore, God the Father is now impregnating Mother Earth with the rain. And the rain was a name for God in the ancient Hindu. There was an, uh, either one God or the concept of God. 
But I remember seeing that many years ago, rain, R-A-I-N. So today, when you see the water flowing from the heavens, coming from God the Father up in heaven, and the waters falling to the earth, Mother Earth, Mother Nature will be impregnated with water, and now she's going to give birth to new life, new plants, new animals. Everything's going to be clean and new. So that's why we get the idea of Mother Earth being impregnated by Father God, God the Father, at the marriage feast of Cana, and it happens in spring. And so today we still have our spring weddings. That's typical of Europe and the European people, of which we Americans are. We are still having the idea of a of a spiritual wedding between man and woman, between male and female in today in the spring. So we have spring weddings where mother is going to marry God the Father. <clears throat> so we have spring weddings. And, of course, after the spring wedding, there's going to be reproduction of life because that's what the animals are doing. That's what the animals are doing in spring. They're reproducing, and the plants are reproducing, and anything that's alive is reproducing. They're all reproducing. Why? Because, thank God, the sun has come back. God's son, the light of the world, said he would return. He promised he would return, and he did. And now we got life back again, and now we can enjoy life again because the sun is going to get really warm until the first day of the summer where it's really hot, and then later on he's really hot, and then, of course, he'll cool off, typical of the sun will cool off, and then he will fall in the fall, and he's not as hot as he used to be, and now he's going to fall even further down into uh, the southern hemisphere where he will actually die. To us in the northern hemisphere, we're going to, well, we don't have the sun anymore. It's gone. It's freezing cold up here and ice everywhere. And thank God he will return though. And every year he always returns. And so that's what Christianity was all about. It was referred to as the celebration of the invincible sun. The sun was invincible. You could not overthrow the power of God's sun. He will come back. Every year he comes back and brings new life and new warmth and food and a new life to the to the human family in the northern hemisphere. That's the basis for the symbolic story called Christianity. Mm. It has to do with all of the normal uh, movements of the sun during the year with the 12 apostles or the 12 signs of Joseph, the 12 brothers of Joseph or the 12 tribes of Israel. And I just cringe when I hear people talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. There was no 12 tribes of Israel. It's just a story. Mm -hmm. It's just a story. That's why the Bible is called the greatest story ever told. It's not the greatest collection of historical facts ever published. It's the greatest story ever told. It's nothing but a story. The 12 signs of the, of the zodiac as what's being talked about when you talk about the 12 signs of, of the zodiac are the 12 brothers of Joseph, the 12 apostles, the 12 uh, prophets of, of Israel, the 12 major prophets, the 12, uh, the 12 stones on the breastplate of the high priest. Everything is done in sequence of 12. Why? Because that's the way the world works. Mm. It's a 12-step program. You start in the first grade and you end up in the 12th grade. So it's a 12-step program. Whether you're an alcoholic or not, it's still a 12-step program. <laughs> Life is a 12 steps. That's why you have 12 apostles. The 12 apostles are the 12 months of the year represented by 12 major constellations of the zodiac. And the zodiac obviously is there only because we, it's important to us because of the sun. And the sun has four lives, uh, spring, summer, autumn, winter, Matthew, mm -hmm. Mark, Luke, and John. Four, the four gospels are telling you the story of God's son. So the bottom line at the end of the day is quite simply, there was no Jesus. He never existed. But it is a very powerful, encoded, symbolic metaphor story, which right. basically is telling the world of mankind the same thing 
It told the ancient peoples of the world. It's still telling us today the same story, that there is a war on the earth between light and darkness, Mm -hmm. between the coming of the sun that brings light and warmth and energy and food and flowers and everything wonderful for human life, comes into the world when the sun rises each morning. He is our risen Savior. Of course, the sun is your risen Savior. If it don't come up, we're going to be dead in three weeks. The earth is going to be frozen over. So therefore, the sun is your risen Savior. And he is the, and he is a triune God. Father, God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Ghost. Why? Because he's a child when he's born. He's full grown adult at 12 noon and he's an old man who's going to die at night and so it's the same son there's only one god it's a son god so there's only one god but three divine persons okay. father son and holy ghost so one god but three persons yeah the one god is the baby in the morning the newborn son at 12 noon he's he's fully matured and at, at six o'clock at night he's old and dying and leaving the world and my god he's going to leave the world in the hands of the prince of darkness who was in egypt was called set why because it gets dark at sunset <clears throat> the entire story of the new testament in the bible is a metaphor a symbolic story which has been presented as actual history to the people of this world to control them, to frighten them, so the the boogeyman is going to get you when you die, and you're going to go to hell and you'll burn in hell forever. And that's what the kings believed. So that's why the Pope could dictate whatever he wanted that the kings to believe they would believe because he could condemn them to death. And when they died, they were going to burn forever in hell. And as I told you, I found out a long time ago when I was nine years old, you can't burn a spirit. Right. Spirits can't burn. Well, that, that's so, what they would tell you because, I mean, obviously, look, it, 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 you, you can light these things on fire, but these things are not in this world. So how does that work? Yeah, that, that that's one of the most interesting questions. Now, there, there's another part of this, too, that needs to be uh, understood, and that is that there's a <laughs> lot of synchronism. In various of what, you know, people again dismiss as, well, that's the old pagan religion. That's, uh, you know, the lies of before that are, there, there's a huge composite here with, with the, uh, the, the story and practices and even the commonly sort of accepted elements of Christianity even because when, when one looks at the Saxons previous to them becoming Christians, right? When they mm-hmm. had, uh, gods and goddesses. Um, cause this is where I always thought the word Easter came from, but th- there's like a hundred explanations <laughs> for, for all where kinds Easter of came from, right? For where the word came from. Like the idea that, okay, in the Northern Hemisphere, cause like you've said many times, you know, this is a, a, a creation for the Northern Hemisphere. Mm-hmm. Where does the sun come from? It comes from the East. Okay. <clears throat> but th- and, there- and then when you understand that the sun is a star. Mm-hmm. And it rises in the east. Right. It's an east star. Well, it, it, it sure is. And there's another word, though, that the Saxons used to use uh, that had to do with a goddess that That's right. a sacrifice was made for at around the very calendar time of Passover. <laughs> That's right. So, exactly. Because the sun, God's sun, the light of the world, has officially passed over the equator and the first beginning, the first beginnings of of, uh, of spring, and we know when spring begins, when the sun officially passes over the equator. And so it was referred to as the Passover, mm-hmm. because the Passover was the sun officially passing over the uh, the equator. So that's why they call it the Passover. And the Jews today still still worshiping the sun. And we know that they're worshiping the sun because the very word for God is so holy that the Jews will tell you that we should not use God's name in vain, meaning you should not ever use his name, period, because you're not Jewish and you don't have the, you don't have the wherewithal to understand the importance of God. So therefore you need to keep your mouth shut and stay out of it because only the Jews know God's name, his holy name. 
Mm-hmm. And so, but if you're going to use God's name, even the Jews are told not to use his name <clears throat> in vain. Don't just use his name anytime you want. So Judaism has developed a word for their God, which is a substitute word for God. It is not God's name, but it is a word what the Jews realize <clears throat> and have told us that it is a substitute word for their God, that it's all right to use, it's okay to use it. And that word is tetragrammaton. The tetragrammaton mm-hmm is on the altar of all uh, uh, all the synagogues in the world always show <clears throat> on the altars of any synagogue ever anywhere no matter where it is on the earth there's always going to be in a synagogue the word tetragrammaton and the tetragrammaton is four hebrew letters inside of a sun and you will always see on the altars or somewhere in, in the synagogue a sunburst. You'll see the sun with the spokes <clears throat> and the sun with the round sun with the spokes. And inside of that round symbol of the sun with the spokes, you will see the uh, four Hebrew letters. And that four Hebrew letters is a substitute name for God. Mm-hmm. And that substitute name, the Jews will tell you, they call it the Tetragrammaton. Tetra meaning four. Tetra, four, and that's exactly what it is. It's four letters inside the sun. It's tetra gramma. And gramma is a letter. That's why we gra- grammatical. Gramma, gramma is a letter like A, B, C, and D. So tetragrammaton is tetra, four, gramma letters, four letters for the Hebrew god named Aton, A-T-O-N. A T O N. Look it up in the dictionary. Look up Aton. Aton was the god of the sun in ancient Egypt. He's referred to as the Aton. So therefore, the god of the Jews today on all altars in all synagogues, you will see the name for God, Tetragramma Aton. Tetragrammaton. They're still worshiping the sun as they always have. Is a very ancient religion based on sun worship. And I'm telling you, there was, in fact, historically, no ancient Israel ever existed. Therefore, all the stories which we are told about ancient Israel, with all of her kings and all the wondrous things that the prophets did, or opening up the Red Sea like Moses did, all of these wonderful things God does not do today. Nowhere, period, does God open up any lake or any stream or any river or anywhere. Why? It's because it never happened to start with. It's part of a story. The Bible is called the greatest story ever told. Mm-hmm. It's merely a story. It has no basis in actual fact at all. And with that, keep in mind that King David never existed. There was no King David. I don't care what you show me. No King David ever existed because in the old ancient Bibles, the go back as far as we can go, you will see in the old Bibles where if you go into the Bible and read a, a scripture that talks about King David, you will see that it doesn't say David, D-A-V-I-D. That's what we, we today call it, King David. But in the old Bibles, it was referred to as King Druid, D-R-U-I-D, right. Druid, King Druid. And so what we call Judaism today is a Druidic religion. The Druids called themselves in history Hebrews. Right. And read the history books about, about Druids, and it will tell you the Druids <clears throat> called themselves Hebrews, and they wore they had they have what they call high priests, and the high priests were <clears throat> were dressed exactly like the Hebrew high priest, the Druid high priest. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Why are they called high priests? I've often wondered because I know that the ancient priests in Europe were all mushrooms, sacred mushrooms. And I've often wondered, is that why they call them high priests? Because the priests were high on mushrooms? I know that that's what the Hebrews were doing with, with Moses. When he sent them out in the morning, the scripture said that Moses sent uh, the Hebrews out 
to pick the manna from heaven. Manna from heaven turns out to be sacred mushrooms. Mm -hmm. They were little round things that grew in the morning dew. The scripture said, the Bible says, I didn't say it. The Bible says that Moses told the Hebrews to go out and pick the manna from heaven. The very word manna simply means in the ancient language we call Hebrew, the very word manna means what is it? They didn't know what it was. But Moses says, see all those little round white things in the morning do? You know, when the sun comes up, the dew will evaporate. Go out and pick those little round things and eat them and keep your mouth shut. You're always complaining that you're starving. Well, God is giving you mushrooms. Go out and pick all the mushrooms you want and eat them all. And therefore, this is why the Hebrew people were able to talk to God. Well, of course, if you eat enough mushrooms, you're going to talk to God. Mm -hmm. And so and now we go back into the history. Go back to the history books in the library. Go right. to the Jewish synagogue and talk to the talk to the uh, to the teachers in the synagogues, and the rabbis will tell you. But you have to talk to them by themselves, single. They don't like talking about this kind of stuff in front of each other. But if you talk to one of the rabbis by himself, <clears throat> and, if, and if he's honest, he'll tell you, "Yes, you're right. It's true. <clears throat> Moses was on mushrooms, and there was no Moses. It's just a story about." Uh, a cult that was following the moon, a moon worshiping cult, and Moses was a leader of a moon worshiping cult. And this is why today you'll see, and it goes back to the time when Moses, <laughs> uh, I've talked about this before, I'll say it again. In oh, the Bible, we, we don't we don't need to go back over that because I mean we we've been over it several times about you know Moses going to the mountain and the moon and I, it was actually kind of funny if you go back and listen to that guys I, I suggest you go back and here's why I want to go forward with something else yeah um, when when I when I mentioned that whole thing about the Saxons the reason I mention it is because the name of that goddess now I've never heard it pronounced properly so I'm not going to try is E O S T R E. That's it. Which That's exactly right. E A S T R E. Well, it, it yeah, it looks like it looks like Easter, doesn't it? But I've seen it written E O S. But yeah, as we I have to. as we well know, the the the, the vowels are interchangeable sometimes, especially mm -hmm. with these ancient. But that's the way the Saxons they had a different mm -hmm. tongue than the English we think of today. It's wholly different now. But here's another interesting part about this: even the word Passover, because we've mentioned Passover many times, and there's a practical reason for calling it Passover. But again, because of the way the language is structured. Well, okay, Greek is one of the languages of preservation for the scriptures, right? Isn't that yep. like generally accepted? Mm -hmm. Well, in the Greek, when you see now today English translations that say Passover in the Old Testament, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Greek word is, is, is Pasha. That's right. P-A-S, P-A-S-C-H. A, right. P A S C H A, Pasha. Right, and now it's substituted for Passover. <coughs> but, you know, it, it, it's interesting because it, the composite that comes together and in tradition and practice and even the way the English language winds up translating these things, it is, it, it is a rather fascinating design because <coughs> it doesn't lend itself to the one thing you keep saying, which is this is not history. This is metaphorical. This is literally, but it's so complex mm -hmm. and overlaps, you know, because without the Germanic influence over, over the English language, you know, the vowels might not be as interchangeable as they are. Uh, because the, the ancient German language that existed before the German that they speak today, not the same language, <laughs> mm -hmm. but right. it influences what we call English. <laughs> Uh, because as you've said, English is a designer language. But what's funny is that English absolutely brings together all of these languages, uh, from Latin to the Greek to, you know, all of the, the, the represent, it's very, very fascinating. You will not find this in, you know, cause a lot of people say, well, it's similar to Spanish. And no, Spanish doesn't do this. <laughs> um, it, it, it's rather curious. That, uh, that the English language seems to have been ready-made, literally, um, 
to work right along with all of this, to bring every language together, to bring every tradition together, whether it preexisted, because when we're talking about the Saxons giving a sacrifice basically to uh, encourage fertility at exactly yep. the time of the Passover, it, it makes sense. They're appeasing their gods, and they did this whether it was a swamp or it was time to plant crops or anything. Uh, please don't freeze us to death in the winter. They had to appease their gods. This is way mm-hmm. before Christianity. This is way before what they claim to be historical Judaism. And all of it winds up in all these different parts of the world, whether you're talking about the Canaanites who are very far away from the Saxons, <laughs> right? Yep. Mm-hmm. It all comes together in two places. And that is what, what, again, I'm sorry to use the phrase, but you know what I'm talking about if I use it, the Abrahamic religions. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the English language. It seems to me as though there's a very special relationship between the English language and the three, you know, major Western religions. There's a very special relationship there. And it seems to me as though the designer, even though it's done over a long period of time, it's almost like the same designer created this. So that you had this labyrinth to go through. I mean, a- a- am I seeing a pattern here that, uh, you know, that I just want to see or uh, what do you think? No, no, you're seeing it. As I've said it so many times. I'll say it again. All three religions can be traced back in history and all three religions are using the same conceptual ideas and belief systems and the words and the terms. They're all telling you something symbolic. But we humans like we like to think of it as actual history, mm. but there's there is no real history in uh, in Islam and Christianity or Judaism. It's all based on metaphorical stories, metaphors, and symbolic metaphors going back into history. Somebody has designed our religions. They've designed our education. Somebody has decided what it is we humans are going to believe, what we're going to teach, and what we're going to do. And somebody is is controlling us from outside the earth, from off planet. And I believe that there are spirits, that there are actual spirits we call them poltergeists, demons, devils, angels, sons of God, spirits, uh, angels. I don't know what they are, but there's no doubt in my mind that they do exist. There are, there is with us right now on this earth other life forms that are not of this world. They are spirits, demons, devils angels, all kinds of spiritual creatures. And these, whoever they are, because they're here, because too many times we have not proven that they are here. And all the ancient religions of the world realized that there were demons and devils and good angels, bad angels, and angel is simply ange, which is a messenger, and L was God. And so Angel is a messenger of God. Well, what are you talking about? I'm not sure what we're talking about. I'm sure that there's something out there that is communicating with us and is guiding our lives. It's our destiny. They're guiding us and what we believe and what we do politically Mm -hmm. and how we're living our lives as humans. Something out there is guiding us, and we don't see it, so therefore it doesn't register with us, and therefore it doesn't bother us. We don't see that there are spirits who are guiding the destiny of the human family. They mess with you. They're they're feeding you with ideas and belief systems and teaching you things where we we grow up as a baby. When we come into the world, we just accept the things which our parents are a part of. We accept the culture, we accept their belief systems and whatever they whatever they believe, that's what we believe. Mm-hmm. Never realizing that where your parents got the idea was from spirits. From ancient times, the ancient world, there were other entities who were here, spirit creatures that were teaching the human race how to do things and what to believe. And so I'm totally sure that's the bottom line on everything we're talking about, is Mm -hmm. that our religions, our belief systems, our political, educational systems are all designed for us by the spirit world, off-planet spirit world has been messing with us 
for a long, long time, right. millions of years ago. There have been spirits here on this earth, and we don't see them, we don't relate to them, and they know it, and so they can use us, they watch us, and we're told in the Bible about the evil spirits, and the demons, and the devils, and the angels. I think there is, in fact, something to that idea that we humans are being misled, we're being played for fools. And we don't question very deeply anything. We don't question where things come from. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a pyramid, a pyramid the size of the Great Pyramid of Egypt, sitting on the ocean floor, on the bottom of the ocean floor in the Atlantic, 10 miles north of Bimini in the area called the Bahama Banks. But nobody seems to give a damn about the pyramid that's sitting out on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. Nobody seems to care about how it got there. And virtually nobody knows anything about it because it's not important. It's just a pyramid sitting out there in the ocean. But I'm the kind of person that says, wait a minute, what's going on here? Where did we get this idea of pyramids? Where did pyramids come from? And how come there's one on the ocean floor in the Atlantic? How come there are three pyramids on the Giza Plateau? What's going on with these pyramids and with all these ancient temples and the, and the Baalbek stones and all these great stone uh, you know, buildings and things which have been presented to us? I mean, there are stones uh, that have been cut incredibly smooth, right. beautiful, large stones that weigh like a thousand tons. A thousand ton stone cut flawlessly so that the, the side of the stone is like a mirror. It has a mirror finish and it's crystal clean and the cut is like a razor's edge on the, on the edge because something cut a thousand ton stone perfectly flawlessly and laid it into place with other thousand ton stones and built a great great uh, buildings and great edifices. And I'm just saying mm. somebody better look at where we have come from, who we humans are, and are we being played by spirit entities that you could call extraterrestrials or UFOs and all that connection is there in the Bible that they were called spirits and demons and devils. We're talking about the same thing. A spirit world is leading all of us, and we're so damnable, ignorant, and self-centered and egotistical, we are playing right into the hands of the spirit world that's leading us. Even our leaders right. are misleaders. They're being led by spirits. We're talking about demonism, devil worship. And my God, that's become very big now in the world today. You hear a lot about devil worshipers and demonism and child sacrifice and altar boys and raping young, young, young boys. Right. All of that goes back to the same original churches and religion of the Middle Ages, which were doing the same thing they've always done. And all religions have to do with the war between light and darkness, with sex, with the sun, sun worship, the worship of the moon, the worship of the planet Saturn. Right. It's a whole study, and you need to spend years and years reading and studying it right. to understand it finally. And I'm trying to help you so you don't have to spend years. No, and I'm I appreciate it. I, I got to tell you, I really appreciate it. And I, and I advise people, since you mentioned it, uh, to enter into a search engine, if you like, the phrase Bimini, the Bimini Road. And yep. that'll be a common search. I, I read about this as a kid because there were studies done on it in the 1960s. So they were in my libraries when I was a kid, and I used to read books in the library, you know, when those were a thing. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, the Bimini Road would be a good place to start. And you can find out about what, what you know, what Jordan was just mentioning. And uh, probably you never heard anywhere else about that pyramid. Okay. Uh, now, we got a hostile sort of... Uh, uh, message and i want to address it uh jordan so i'm gonna do that <laughs> okay just really quickly uh i i have i have Give us barabbas yes absolutely this person wants barabbas i think <laughs> so <laughs> you know what I, I i can't give you barabbas i'm sorry i'm gonna give you something else but i'm first gonna let let your voice be heard through mine since you sent me a text uh which is very simple i hear uh, people like you talk about everything being a metaphor because you don't want to 
recognize the truth of the Lord. And this is the thing that will damn you. Uh, and this is a message directed at me during this show about what it is we're discussing. Uh, he goes on to say that his name is Kerry, and he goes on to say a couple things about uh, how I'm going to go to hell and so on and so forth. Okay. Kerry, uh, here's here's the interesting thing. Um, you, you're denying that everything is in metaphorical phrases in Scripture because – you say there's some evidence for some of these. This is another part of it. It's very long, Jordan, but I read this while you were talking, and I'm just stunned. Um, there's some evidence for things like the flood in certain areas of the world and stuff like that, and, and he makes reference to this. This is like three paragraphs long. Um, here's the problem. Metaphors, no matter how you shape them, if people can't relate to them, Carrie then they make no sense. So you do take elements from the real world and create metaphors from them. So a global flood is not necessarily something that absolutely historically happened, although if you're writing it at an earlier time in history and there's been a lot of floods or there's been recently a lot of floods and you want to relate it to it, that's a more uh, efficient metaphor to be made to the people. So here's the thing. They don't create stories out of thin air when you're telling truth through metaphor. You have to actually relate it to something. They don't tell you about some creature you never heard of when they tell you about Jesus Christ. They tell you about a man because you can relate to it. They tell you about different things that you can relate to. If, if you can't relate to a metaphor, there is no point in telling it. Okay? So... The thing is, because the metaphor is, is the truth and that's it and that's the history and I'll tell you something. I, I absolutely agree with Jordan on this. And, uh, you know, you think I'm an awful person for it. That's fine. That's fine. I, I, I don't mind. And yes, take Barabbas. <laughs> Because yep. I have nothing else to offer you. And there's also a scripture in the New Testament where a group of people came up to Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember where it is. It's in the, it's in the four, four Gospels. A group of people came up to Jesus and they said to him, Why do you talk to us in riddles and metaphors and symbols? Why do you talk to us in riddles? And the scripture says that without riddles and metaphors, Jesus never said a word to no one. Anything he said was a metaphor and a riddle. And so the people came up to him and said, why do you speak to us? Why don't you just tell us outright what you want us to know instead of speaking with these strange riddles that you come up with, these strange symbolic stories? Why don't you just tell us? And he said, I speak in riddles because I don't want you to get the truth. I don't want you to know the truth. I don't want anything to do with you because I know your heart. I know who you really are. I know what you really live like. And I don't want anything to do with you. So I speak in riddles so that only the God Spirit will let you open your eyes, spiritually speaking, to see what the real truth is. I speak in riddles because I don't want you to get the message. I don't want you to see the light. I want you to continue in your same dark light that you live in, in your ignorance and ill-informed ignorance. I don't want you to get the light and the truth so that you will change your life and become a better person. I don't want you to know the truth. That's why I speak in riddles. So that's the name of that tune. Mm. And and isn't it more intelligent, Jordan, actually? Because, you know, when, when you're teaching somebody, and I've had to teach people a lot of things in, in, in life, even when I, when, when I worked at certain businesses. I've had to teach people procedures and, oh, how to do things, let's just say, in, in general. Mm-hmm. If you can relate it to something else... You're teaching in metaphor when you say, well, think of it like this. This is the most effective way. You know why? Because it actually makes them have to go through the process of thinking about it, relating it to something that they're comfortable with. That's right. You know, Mm -hmm. they actually have to work to get to it. It, 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 It's like that that old phrase about throwing your pearls before swine. Now, swine don't know what to do with pearls. 
That's right. But somebody else. But that's else. why we have something called Aesop's <laughs> fables. Aesop's fables. Yes. The old, the old fable that we tell the children about the race between the tortoise and the hare, between the rabbit and the tortoise. And it's an old story I heard when I was a child. Mm-hmm. And it was an old story. It's called Aesop's fables. And the idea of the story was that the tortoise and the, and the rabbit challenged each other to a race. And the rabbit took off and ran wide open and got right up to the uh, to the finish line. And to be arrogant and self-centered and smart aleck, he laid down by the finish line, but he didn't cross the finish line. He laid down to take a nap because he's run all the way and it's already there and the, and the tortoise hadn't even moved yet. And so the tortoise finally starts to move very slow and the rabbit sound asleep. And the tortoise keeps working and just very, very slowly keeps moving toward the goal line. And very quietly, he walks across the goal line, the, the tortoise does, and he won the race. And so that teaches a child, just because you're smart, because you're handsome, because you're wealthy, that doesn't mean you're going to win the race. Just because you got all the money and you look good and you've got everything going for you, you may end up with a cancer and dying while some old man in, 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 in some foreign country may work all of his life to build a, a house and to have his home and to have a family. And he's got a wonderful family, a beautiful home. He's got everything a man could want. And But he didn't run. He's not fast like you and clever like you and wealthy. He's just a poor working class person who ends up at the end of his life with a lovely family, a wife and children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And you ended up on drugs with an overdose in the hospital and died a horrible death. You ended up in a horrible accident because you were crazy in your driving. So just because you're smart and clever and wealthy doesn't mean you're going to win the race. It's the slow who win the race, not the fast, not the clever, not the resourceful. And so it teaches a child. It's called Aesop's Fable. Well, that's what the Bible is. We talk about Bible codes. Well, the entire story is a code. It's encoded inside of a mystery. And we, and we understand that this, the whole Bible is a metaphor. It's a symbolic story. Mm-hmm. And the symbolism, as we leave this show today, the symbolism of the Bible, especially the New Testament story of Jesus, is the war going on on the earth between ignorance and light, light and darkness. The light is considered to be good and wonderful, and the dark is evil and frightening. And I can understand why children are afraid of the dark. I understand that. But I don't understand how grown, intelligent people are frightened to death of the light. They don't want to hear the truth and the light. They're not interested in truth and the light. They will tell you, give us Barabbas. We want to hear the same old silly stories and all the lies and deception that the politicians can come up with, what the clergy of the church can come up with. We want to hear all the lies. Why? Because we like them. We like these people because they're like us. We're liars and they're liars and we know they're lying. Mm -hmm. And we want to believe what they're telling us is the truth. And that's why we give a lot of money so that the clergyman in the church can buy his $7 million jet plane and live in a $14 million beautiful home off the ocean. And so that's the way the world works. We don't want the truth. We can't handle the truth. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I've been trying and you've been trying and other people like us are trying to do is do something for the human family by enlightening the human family Mm -hmm. so we can understand who we are, where we've come from, and you better start uh, checking on authority. You better start questioning authority and what you believe because the whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. The scripture said the entire world is lying in the power of the devil, mm-hmm. which is simply putting a D in front of the word evil. Evil with a D becomes devil and God without good without the old becomes God. God is good. The devil's evil. 
You better go back and start doing some homework and find out what you think you believe and what you think you know. You have no idea in the world where it really came from and that you're missing out because you're self-centered, egotistical, like the Pharisees. That's why Jesus condemned the Pharisees, because they knew everything. They don't need anything. They know they got the law. They know they are the Pharisees and the scribes. The scribes write scripture. The scribes were, uh, were condemned by Jesus because they write all the Christian books. The scribes are the writers. They write all the Christian books. You go into a Christian bookstore, you see thousands of Christian books by people who are writers who believe that they understand what's going on and they're trying to tell you. And point of fact, under the heat of day and under the heat of, uh, of investigation, you find they don't know what they're talking about. They have no idea what the words mean, where the ideas have come from. They haven't studied the uh, comparative religions and comparative philosophies. It's an incredible world of ignorance that the human family finds itself in today. And I'm trying to do something about it by trying to enlighten the people of this world that the governments and the religions, their banking and their educational institutions, the military, the entire world of mankind is lying in the power of darkness, stupidity and right. ignorance. Well, here's the thing to remember about that, and it's a very simple lesson. Again, you, you, you remind me of childhood lessons all the time, Jordan, because sometimes we need to take things back to the most basic elements. I think right. uh, mm-hmm. when when I was a, a bit afraid of the dark as a small child, I remember being told that, uh, look, y- you have no reason to be afraid. The same thing that is there in the dark is there in the light. It's the same thing. So if you're not afraid to be there in the light, you shouldn't be afraid to be there in the dark. OK, and and it sounds silly, right? But but here's you're right. But here's the great point about it is that it really doesn't matter if you insist on keeping your eyes closed, whether it's light or dark, does it? And that's, that's right. That's what I, what I feel inspired to say here at the end is that if, if you want to insist on not looking, not using your senses, not using all of the gifts that were granted you by virtue of your creation. Yep. Regardless of who you think created you, uh, whether you think it's just your parents or you think that, you know, a stork brought you, it doesn't matter. I don't care. Point is. Well, like I have said mm-hmm. that uh, your brain is like a parachute. It don't work if it's not open. <laughs> you need to have an open mind to learn and read and understand you are nothing but a product of the culture you were born into. Right. If you were Chinese, you would believe what Chinese believe. If you were Africans, you believe what Africans believe. If you were uh, Catholic, you believe what Catholics believe. You need to wake up and understand all the world is believing what their culture has taught them. And our culture has taught us nothing, well, period. But just like the tortoise and the hare, because you began the race that way, does not mean that that's the way it has to end. No, but this true. this show does now end, and uh, because we're at the end of the time that we allot for it, but I do advise you to continue looking into this by going to jordanmaxwellshow.com. dot com. Yes, put all three of those things together, jordanmaxwellshow.com, dot com, because that is the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's. Again, the Research Society is over there. Uh, you can you can contact Jordan. You can make a donation. There's some stuff in the public area for you to examine. I think there's even a couple of shows that I did with Jordan that you might be able to access straight through there but there's other stuff links to videos uh, you know a whole bunch of things over at jordanmaxwellshow.com and uh, you know send your angry emails to me in photochelli.com but if you want to say something nice go over to jordanmaxwellshow.com I'll take the bad <laughs> ones Jordan you can have the good ones I'm, okay, I'm fine with it I, you know what I feel good when somebody acts that way because I, I want them to understand I, I'm not here to harm anyone. I'm not here to, uh, to, to be mean or vicious or anything like that. We are exploring what is presented to us. And we're trying to keep, you know, like that, that analogy I made about being taught about the same thing being in the light and the dark. It doesn't matter if you keep your eyes closed. Yeah, it doesn't. If you don't want to look at these things and you don't want to examine them, then it doesn't matter if you are in the darkness or in the light, does it? Cause you won't see nope. it. 
you're not uh, you're not going to open your mind to it. You don't want to hear it, and that's the same thing that, and we we say the same thing about the Al Qaeda that they were a bunch of fundamentalists, crazy fundamentalists that are killing people. They are really true believers. They are fundamentalists. Well, what about you? Are you a fundamentalist? Yes, fundamentally, you're believing in fundamental Christianity, like Al Qaeda. You are believing something that's not true, just like Al Qaeda is believing things that are not true. And therefore, they were a fundamentalist. Well, what do we call you? You're a fundamentalist. Fundamentally, we're all fundamentalists. We're all believing things which are not true if you're in the world of theology and religion. You need to go back and do some homework. See, thank you for having me on. Oh, absolutely. And here, here's the interesting part about this, too. The thing that the guy took offense to, and I know it's a guy. The thing that the guy took offense to is that he felt like we were saying that the the story in the Bible is a lie. But um, no. neither Jordan nor myself ever said that. What we've told you is that they've lied to you about the story and that uh, right. there's actually a lot more to it. <laughs> That's precisely right. It's not a lie. It's a very powerful story. That's why it's called the greatest story ever told. That's right. The greatest story ever told is the greatest truth that's ever been spoken on the earth. It's in the New Testament. It's called the war between light and darkness. Jesus is God's son, the light of the world, and his enemy is the devil. The word evil with a D in front of the word evil becomes devil. Mm -hmm. The devil is the wearing the Darth Vader. He's the wearing the black robe. He is the evil one that's causing mankind to stumble all over itself and kill each other. And this is why we have alcoholism and drug addiction and wars and violence and gang wars and all kinds of horrible things that the human race is, is guilty of because we are a product of our Western civilization. And the Eastern civilizations are not any better. They are also equally as ignorant, ill-informed, and killing each other as we are. That's so the whole human race needs to wake up and get a whole new life, get a life, Absolutely. and start educating ourselves. 